Okay, welcome, welcome back to the Math 140, uh, aka College Algebra uh, video series. This is the next installment in Simplifying Expressions. Uh, they, um, we've talked about um, handling um, exponents properly, and we've talked about uh, recognizing like terms, and um, now we're going to talk about the proper handling of radicals and discuss what fractional exponents mean. So we've already um, talked about negative exponents. So just to remind you that x to negative 2 is the same thing as 1 over x squared. Or um, 1 over x to the negative 2 is the same thing as x squared. So I think I've said before in the other video that if the negative exponent, if you have a negative exponent, it really means it's in the wrong place in the fraction because negative exponents mean reciprocals, which means it's flipped over. So in this case, the x, in this case, the x, um, the base is at the top of the fraction. And so because it's a negative exponent, then we can put it at the bottom of the fraction and drop the negative exponent. And over here, because the x is in the bottom of the fraction, because, of next, because it has a negative exponent, we can move it to the top and um, drop the negative exponent. So we learned that, we talked about that last week, and you probably already knew that coming in. We also have um, fractional exponents, like x to the one-half. And you may not have been exposed to that yet. I don't know. Um, so that's another way of talking about the roots of something. Um, so that would be a square root. And another way to write that is with a radical. Okay, Or if you have x to the one-third power, that's the same thing as a cube root. Okay, So fractional exponents. Um, the, the number on the bottom of the fraction is a root, and then under the top of, fra of a fraction is a power. So you could have, for example, x to the 3 has power, and that means another way to write that would be the square root of x raised to the third power. So you can see where 3 is the power and the 2 is the root. Now, what is a root? If I, for example, say the square root of 4, that means I'm asking what times itself gives you 4. So the square root of 4 is 2. Why is the square root of 4? Why is the square root of 4 2? Because because 2 times 2 is equal to 4. Right? So you can also think of square root as something that undoes squared. So for example, if I have 2 squared, if I square root that, I get back to 2. Right? Now, we've mentioned um, imaginary numbers. Uh, we mentioned that i is equal to the square root of negative 1. But um, sometimes when we're doing math, we want to limit our number system to just the real numbers, which means we would not consider um, i, uh, uh, the imaginary numbers, as, as part of our um, the realm of possibilities. So um, if I'm dealing in only the real numbers, if I ask what the square root of 4 is, that's obviously 2. If I ask what the square root of negative 4 is, well, we would say there's no answer because um, there's nothing that when you multiply it by itself gives you a negative 4. So in other words, you'd have to do like, for example, 2 times 2, that gives me 4. Negative 2 times negative 2, that also gives me 4. So there's no way to multiply something by itself and get um, negative 4. Okay, so that's just something, and again, that's something that has to be clear that um, generally we're talking about, um, well, as we go further in the class, we will discuss when it's okay to take the square root of a negative number and, and produce an i and therefore deal with imaginary numbers and when, and when it's not. Okay, so getting back to roots, um, we can also talk about a cube root. So if you take the cube root of a number, put a little three in that, let me do that better, cube root, like for example 27, okay, that's saying what times itself 3 times equals 27. So we're saying there is some number raised to the third power that equals 27. And if we think about it for a moment, let's see, 3 times 3 times 3 equals 27. So therefore the cube root of 27 is 3. Okay. So that's the idea, and again, this is something that I'm assuming that most of you know already, so I'm just reminding you of what a cube root or a square root is. Um, but 
at, when they show up in um, expressions, we have to know how to handle them. So for example, if um, I have the square root of, excuse me, something like that, the square root of 27, or I'm sorry, square root of 16, and I'm asked to simplify that, well, clearly a simpler way to write this is just four, right? Um, so, or if I have the square root of 16 plus the square root of 25, again, a simple way to write that would be, well, the square root of 16 is 4, square root of 25 is 5, and 4 plus 5 is 9. Okay, so that's some basic simplifying. Um, things to keep in mind that um, if I'm adding roots, like for example, the square root of 3 plus the square root of 5. Okay. Now, first of all, I look at square root of 3, and I do not know what the square root of 3 is. It's not a what we call a perfect square. So the square root of 3, if you throw it in your calculator, you're going to come up with something greater than 1 but smaller than 2. Um, and it's going to be 1 point something. Okay. Same with square root of 5. It's going to be greater than 2 but smaller than 3. Closer to 2 than 3. So these are not perfect squares. So when I take the square root of 3, um, I have to either approximate it, because the square root of 3 is an irrational number, which means it's never-ending and non-repeating, or I have to leave it alone. If I leave it alone, then I'm still talking about the exact value. If I approximate it, now I'm not talking about the exact value anymore. So um, if we have two radicals like this, the square root of 3 plus the square root of 5, there's no way to simplify that. The square root of 3 plus the square root of 5 is just the square root of 3 plus the square root of 5. Now, if they're both the square root of 3, if I have the square root of 3 plus the square root of 3, um, we can't add those, but we can uh, essentially rewrite them a different way. Um, because, we're again, we're just counting them. Because a, another um, remember that multiplication is just repetitive addition, right? So if I have one square root of 3 here plus another square root of 3, another way to write that is I have two square roots of 3. So again, that 2, remember, is just counting how many times I have added square root of 3 together. Okay? Likewise, uh, however, when I'm multiplying, like the square root of 3 times the square root of 5, because they're both under a square root, I can multiply those together. So the square root of 3 times the square root of 5 is the square root of 3 times 5, which of course is the square root of 15. Okay? So you can um, take the square root of uh, the square root of two different numbers and multiply them together, which also tells us that if I have two numbers like this, the square root of 4 times the square root of 5, or the square root of 4 times 5, aka the square root of 20. Notice in this form, I can break those apart into the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. And now why would on earth would I want to do that? Well, because the square root of 4 is, um, a, perfect, or 4 is a perfect square, so I can take the square root of it. So this would be 2 times the square root of 5. And we really t would consider this a simplest form. So if you um, are, are given a number like the square root of 20, and asked to simplify it or put it in the simplest form, then the proper way to do this is not leave it as square root of 20 and not take the, throw it in the calculator um, and approximate it. You would just write this as the square root of 4 times the square root of 5, which of course is 2 times the square root of 5. So any number that I'm taking the square root of, like 75, if it has a factor that's a perfect square, then I can simplify it. So for example here, this is the same thing as the square root of 25 times the square root of 3. But of course the square root of 25 is 5. So this is equal to 5 times the square root of 3. So and when we're dealing with radicals, that is considered simplifying. So you could have something that looks similar to the, like looks like this, the square root of 40 over 27 times y, oops, y cubed. Okay, in this case, um, just like in the multiplication I can break it apart, I could change this to the square root of 40 over 
the square root of 27 y cubed. And so then I'm looking in these two, um, the top and the bottom, to see if there's any perfect square factors. So in 40, 4 is a factor of 40. So I could rewrite this as the square root of 4 times the square root of 10. And I could rewrite this as 27 has a perfect square factor of 9. So I could rewrite this as, and actually, come to think of it, um, y squared, or y cubed has a factor of y squared, because y squared times y is equal to y cubed, right? So I could factor out a 9 and a y, whoops, sorry, a 9 and a y squared, and that would leave me with a 3 and a y. Okay, so get, just to check, we both we all know that 9y squared times 3y would be equal to 27y cubed, right? And why do we separate these two out? Because they're both perfect squares. So that's going to be equal to 2 times the square root of 10 on top, and 3y times the square root of 3y on the bottom. Right? Now, there are some school of thoughts that would say it's not proper to leave a radical um, on the bottom of a fraction. Uh, so you'll have some math professors or mathematicians that you deal with that are that would say that's that is considered simple, simplified, but others will say it's not as long as there's a radical in the basement. So if I have a radical in the bottom of the denominator, how do I get rid of it? Well, there's a little process called what is called the rationalizing a denominator. Rationalizing the denominator. Right? So if I want to um, get the radical out of the basement, as I would say, you what you do is you multiply creatively by one, meaning that if I want to get rid of that radical, I can just multiply by that same radical. But if I multiply the bottom, if I multiply the top by the same radical, then I'm really just multiplying by 1. That's equal to 1. So it doesn't really change the value. Well, it doesn't change the value of the fraction at all. So in that way, I'm rewriting the, um, the fraction without changing the value of it. So then when I do this, I'd multiply those together, and I'd get 2 times the square root of 30y. Because since they're both under the square root, I can multiply them. And on the bottom... I get 3y times the square root of, um, whoops, nine, whoops, sorry, 9y squared. Now, of course, 9y squared is a perfect square, so I can take the square root of it. So that would be on top, 2 times the square root of 30y. And on the bottom, I'd have 3y times 3y, which, of course, would be... 9y squared. Okay? So that would be considered simplest form if we are um, not allowing the square root to be in the bottom. Just to give you a couple more examples um, of some, like here's a kind of a doozy. 2 times the square root of 50 x squared minus 8x times the square root of 18 minus 3 times the square root of 72x squared. Okay, so here's an expression that we want to simplify. And so um, since there's some addition of fraction here, we want to think about combining like terms. Uh, right now, as it stands, we don't have any like terms. Um, this has an x squared with the square root. Oh, it looks like we might because this has an x squared inside a square root and an x squared inside side of a square root, so that might be a possibility. We'll have to check that out. Um, but first of all, let's try simplifying the radical. So for example, in this case, I have a 2, and that 50 has a perfect square factor in there of 25. So I could take out the square root of 25, and x squared is a perfect square factor, so I can put an x squared here, and that would leave me in here with just a square root of 2. Okay. So once again, as I said, 50, 25 times 2 would give me the 50, and the x squared is still there. So same thing over here. I have a minus 8x. Of course, the square root of 18 has a factor of 9 in it. So that would be the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. And finally, um, in here, uh, let's see. What are the factors of 72? 
think we have a factor of 36 in there actually. You could think nine, but so if we go off to the side here for a moment, um, the square root of 72, that's equal to the square root of nine times the square root of eight. But notice there's another factor, another perfect square factor in eight. So if you, even if you thought that first, you'd pull out another perfect square factor and the end you'd be left with two. So we're looking at three times the square root of 36 because nine times four is 36 times the square root of x. Oh, whoops. Uh -huh. And x squared in there, because that's a perfect square factor, times the square root of 2. OK, now let's simplify all this stuff. So the square root of 25x squared would be 5x, which multiplied by 10, 2 would be 10x times the square root of 2. Uh, the square root of 9 is 3, so 3 times 8 would be 24x times the square root of 2. And finally, uh, square root of 36x squared would be 6x, 6x times 3 would be 18x times the square root of 2. Now when we look at this, we realize we do have um, three um, like terms, don't we? So we have a 10 times the square root of 2x minus a 24 times the square root of 2x and a negative 18 times the square root of 2x. So really, we're looking at the radicals matching up and the x's matching up so that we can add them together. So let's see, that's going to be a negative 14 plus negative 18 is negative 32. So this can be a negative 32 times the square root of 2 x. So this is, um, at this point, uh, the we've covered um, if up to these uh, the first three videos we've covered or is it four now I've lost track of how many I made already uh, we've talked about um, just in general simplifying um, following the order of operations um, and then all the different are some of the different possibilities you're going to run into you have to be aware of how to handle ex exponents properly we have to be under understand how to under handle um, square roots pro and fractional exponents properly. And we need to be able to recognize like terms and know how to handle them. Um, so at this point, um, if you've understood all the concepts in these three videos, you should be able to tackle homework one in the class. Um, and I forgot to point out at the very beginning, uh, this section is covered in the book, in at least in the ebook, in 10.1 and 10.2. I keep making um, a point to say in the ebook because um, I have a copy of the hard, a hard copy of the textbook, and the chapters don't line up exactly right with the um, ebook. So sorry if that's if you're defining that also true. If you ordered a um, hard copy of the book, um, if you look on the in the ebook, then these numbers will steer you to the right location. And so if it, then if you want to look in the hard book, you can. And make that connection by um, seeing which ones match up there. All right.